Hello and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. And at the other end of the series of tubes and wires that we call the internets is Joe, Crazy Writer. How you doing today, Joe? Well, you know, most bald people like me, we still own a comb. We just can't part with it. You know... I went to, I had to go to Walmart on, on Sunday last week. I'm not proud of this. Did you buy the little mini pies? No. Oh, I I did go over to the day old, the day old bakery and bought, um, a, uh, uh, a peach cobbler. Ooh. A cherry pie. Corey's got cherry pie. A blueberry pie. Oh, now you're talking my language. But the reason I went there was for um, some AEW figures. But when I got to the checkout, there were no humans checking people out. I have never been to to a store where there were literally no humans at, you know, doing checkout. It was all automated. All of the human checkout lines. And this was the... Sunday afternoon at like one in the afternoon. So it was busy. And all I could think is, well, then why even have the regular checkout lanes if you're not going to have anyone there? But man, I, I just, as I see something like that, I'm very glad that when I talk to Alexa, I say, please and thank you. Because eventually, the robots will take over, and I want them to know that I'm polite and not to be killed. Oh, hell yeah. I watch Westworld religiously. <laughs> I will say, though, I did see that some places are pulling out their self-checkout stuff. Yes. Because what's happening is they're realizing, I, you know, there's, there seems to be a wave of, oh, my God, we're losing stuff to shoplifting, which statistically isn't true but they do have on camera the spectacular smash and grabs and things like that because even some of the places like yeah we close this store because of shoplifting and then they're usually in poor communities and then they come back and well that wasn't really why but right. some of these places they're pulling it and even now there's a, a business article in cnn right now it says targets testing a new self-checkout policy where they're restricting customers to buying 10 items or fewer. And what they're trying to do is shorten the wait time and better understanding for customers. And I can understand that because, you know, there's times where you get there and they might have two, three lanes of real people. And, you know, when we go shopping at Target, we have a whole cartload of stuff. And you get those people going in to the self checkout line and they're there longer than it would take had they gone seen an actual human. So, but yeah, it's between that and like I said, the they're finding that people are misidentifying things. People are not scanning things. They're mis scanning things like they'll scan two candy bars and then put the milk in the thing. So, it ain't all it's used to be. I prefer it like when I walk in and only have like onesie twosie things. Yeah. But so yeah, it ain't the pancreas they thought it would be, but I can't see it necessarily going away. So yes, I always smile at the camera, you know, because especially at Target, you look at yourself, they got you on camera, just smile, stick my tongue out, do my Steve Austin nee, 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 eyebrow. <laughs> but that's not what we're here to talk about. It's previews time. Yes, and I prefer my previews paper, not digitalized. Thank you very much. So, so. we're doing previews. Uh, the three, this is an interactive. So if you've got your copies, it's previews number 422 for November 23. And this is January and beyond. And uh, then yes. the Marvel's catalog is number 26 for January 24 and the DC Connect is issue number 42. And 
on the uh, comic side cover is from Dynamite, Lilo and Stitch. Actually written by Greg Pak, the guy who did World War Hulk. On the back is a Marvel Select figure of Archangel. Ooh. One tenth scale action figure. And then on the spine are Muppet figures for Uncle Deadly and Pepe the King Prawn. Oh, I am so glad I don't buy action figures. Those are so <laughs> cool. So, shall we begin in previews or should we do Marvel and DC first and then go into previews? Let's do Marvel and DC first because that tends to uh, work pretty good. Let's start with DC because I, I've, I usually bring my previews to work because during the downtime, I'll go through it. But what happened was, is I actually forgot my notebook. So, but I did happen to have the previews customer order form, which is a a paper catalog that comes through that if you were to order from your friendly neighborhood comic shop, you just go through and you check off what you want and then they can flip through it and order stuff. When I had my comic store, I would use it quite a bit. I'm just trying to find the DC in it. I can't find it. DC would not be in it because DC yeah. is not available through previews. Well, that's why I stole a piece of paper out of the printer and I have it right here with me. <laughs> Always a well. I'm not going well, to order it. That's all I brought to do today was read my previews. So, again, I, I start out right away on page one. Batman 428, Robin Lives. Finally revealed from the DC vault, the unpublished alternative ending to Death in a Family, where Jason Todd survives his encounter with the Joker. Corey, give him a little background about this issue. Well, what it was, this was a time when 900 numbers had become huge. Oh, no interwebs, kids. And DC, well, Jim Starlin had proposed a story where Rob, the, the Jason Todd Robin, who had been completely revamped after Crisis, started to show that he was not able to handle the stress of being Robin. It had become too violent, et cetera, et cetera. And in doing that, the fans hated him. They would get letters complaining about Jason Todd. And I think a lot of people forget that, that they revamped, Basically, when he was originally brought in, he had the exact same origin as Dick Grayson. Then after Crisis, Max Collins was told to revamp the origin and make him different. So And what it different. was, it was really weird because also on one issue you pick up and there's Jason Todd taking the hubcaps off the Batmobile. Yeah. Totally out of the blue. It wasn't like... Brand new origin, brand new whatever. Here's a multi-crisis. Things have changed. No, it was just there. And it was right could, after Batman Year One. Yeah, and you could take it or leave it. And then when Jim Starlin took over as writer, he made Robin progressively more dislikable, um, more violent, to the point where there was an issue where Robin had somebody uh, on a window ledge. And the guy fell off the ledge, but we didn't see, and it was, Batman did not know if the man jumped or if Robin pushed him. So we do a story where uh, the Joker, and this story, when you go back and read it, is batshit crazy. The Joker has become the ambassador to the United Nations for Iran, kidnaps Jason Todd's mom, who we did not know was alive <laughs> and, because in pre-crisis, both his parents had died. And then in this issue, it ended with the Joker beating the crap out of Jason Todd with a crowbar. All under the comic code authority, kids. And an explosion. And then will Robin live or die? You decide called it's 900 number and what was it either 50 cents or 99 cents yeah. at all and call this number if you want him to die and what they had done they had drawn both endings 
So the and it was near Thanksgiving when this happened because I remember they came back after Thanksgiving to get the totals. And Denny O'Neill was actually surprised that Robin had died. And I don't think anybody else at DC was surprised because you'd made Robin a prick. So they went with the, you know, Robin had died artwork. Well, the Robin did not die artwork was still there. And it leaked and has been online and has been in magazines and stuff. So now what they're going to do, they're going to print the 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 ending if Robin would have lived. And this is $4.99 with a fo foil cover that is $7.99 and a variant cover that is $5.99. <laughs> foil cover. So here's your chance to get it again. This is like this is almost like a deep cut because some of you people are like, why would I care? But again, they're they're reaching to kind of pull at our nostalgia. It's the same creative teams working on it. Well, worked on it. So. Well, but it is. It's they didn't even. It's just been sitting at DC. So it's yeah. like, OK, send these pages to the printer instead. Yeah, so kind of a neat idea. Take it or leave it. But I've I've. I'll probably just pick up the regular one because I'm curious. I don't even think I have my original one. So that is the one that paid for my Christmas that year. Ooh, yeah. I knew it was going to be a big deal. I worked at Schinder, so I pre ordered 20 of each issue. And then about two months later, I took them to the College of Comic Book Knowledge. I got 10 bucks each for them. Cool. Now, on the next page, we are getting a revamp of Action Comics. It's written by Jason Aaron, who has his exclusive with Marvel is up. And what they're going to be doing with Action Comics now is Action Comics is not going to be, you know, Jason Aaron is on it to, for, you know, the long haul. It's nope, Jason Aaron's going to tell a story. And then this next creative team will tell a story. And this next creative team will tell a story. But unlike a lot of the anthology books they've done this with in the past, they will also tie in with the main Superman continuity. And I'm interested in seeing what Jason Aaron does with Superman. Yeah, same here. Same here. Do you have, assuming they're all the same, well, probably not the 1 in 25, et cetera, any cover that you like? Chris Bacalo, man. I love Chris Bacalo's art. I think I would go with the Phil Jimenez one, Lois that, and. Uh, that's George Jimenez. George? Oh, doesn't yes. matter. I'll go with him anyways. Not Phil. Oh, I see it down below. Yeah. I wonder why Phil Jimenez does not do more comics because every time he does, it's amazing. Oh yeah. His stuff is a lot like George Perez, <laughs> and I don't mind that. That Joel Jones cover looks pretty sweet. Yeah, so, Joel Jones yeah. is really good too. But man, that Chris Bacalo cover just sings. Yeah. The next one for me, I point out is we're going to jump up to page 21 if you got your guide with you. And it is Power Girl number five. Why I point this out? Because this is a, well, the cat's out of the bag. Streaky takes the center stage in a hair raising adventure. Will the super pet have what it takes to save Metropolis from its greatest canine threat? Or is the city really gone to the dogs? Tons of different booby, I'm sorry, variants for Power Girl. <laughs> there, I will probably, this is one of those, there's an action comics one where Super Dog takes place and he's basically mourning that Superboy, Connor, passed away. And I've sold off most of my Superman run, but I kept that one just because it's a standalone just a tug your heartstring, good story. I've always had a soft spot for Superdog. When I did, I think I told the story when I, I had a choice on the newsstand, the Kiss Super Special or the Superman Family $1 book that had a Superdog story in it. Wow, well, I got to go with the Superdog. Shows how much I know. So I point that out just because it, it sounds like a done fun and one. And I've enjoyed Power Girl so far. What you got next, Mr. S? If you go to page 24. Ooh. DC Power 2024. DC Power 
returns for round two with news with brand new stories spotlighting black characters from across the DC universe by an all-star cast of writers and artists. I love these anthology books. We know that. And then on the next page is another anthology book mm -hmm. that I'm also getting, How to Lose a Guy Gardener in 10 Days. Romance is re rarely a simple affair. Love is almost always followed by some sort of conflict, whether you're plastic man twisting yourself into knots trying to please someone, or the flash traveling back in time to make a catastrophic 51st states perfect, or even a lonely robot who just can't seem to find love unless it's mail from a computer screen like Red Tornado. Love actually is a pain in the 27 dresses. I, I love these anthology books. Oh, yeah. I just do. They're a fun read. You don't have to know a lot of continuity. You can just step in. I, you know, for regular stuff, I will read it on on the app. Or if I really like it when I read it on the app, I'll buy the trade paperback or the Omni. But for these, just a nice one shot to read before bedtime or when I'm laying around the house. Joe, yeah. am I ever going to get to lay around the house? I, for all I know, you're laying on the, around the house right now. No, I'm I'm recording a podcast. Hang on, let me check. Oh yeah, I guess you aren't laying around. Sorry, just had to check your Homeland Security camera. Well, oh, that's I said good. too much. Anyways, next page, page twenty six, twenty seven. Interesting idea. It's called DC Uncovered, and what they're doing, they're reprinting. Am I saying it? Yeah, they're they're reprinting the best of sold out comic stories with brand new sexy booby covers. Not as well, well definitely in the Power Girl Uncovered, which is reprinting the from Brittany Hauser and all sorts of different variant covers. There's Birds of Prey number one uncovered, and there's the Joker Joker Harlequin uncovered number one. Interesting idea. They're all $5.99. There's their one shots, their card stock. There's variant covers or there get some top notch names doing the different stuff. If you want a Frank Cho art cover, you can get one with him doing Power Girl. So a little I, I don't know. I guess some of this stuff. Is older stock. I'm trying to think if it's like you're just read, you're just doing books from last year or you're just doing stuff. But I think it's kind of an interesting idea. It's a different take on facsimiles because you're giving new covers. And judging by some of the crazy prices on the eBay's, yeah, you put Power Girl on a cover, you got some gold there, baby. I do love the Alex Ross Joker Joker Harley Quinn cover. It's going to be the foil variant cover. So. Check it. Take a peek on those pages. You might see a book you like. You might not. And of course, as time goes on, you'll we'll point out more. If you're looking for something new, page 28, John Constantine, Hellblazer, Dead in America, number one. You demanded it. The celebrated creative team of C. Spurrier and Aaron Campbell have returned. John Constantine has cheated death once again, but his heart is not beating. His body is decaying, and he, his his friend Nate and his or Nat and his son Noah are on the run in America, wanted for murder. Naturally, it's all John's fault. Always is, but it turns out Dream himself needs John's help. Something terrible is taking root in America, and it's using the sand from Dream's pouch to impose at will. John can put a stop to it. He might be able to parlay that favor into a chance to save all the lives, but he's going to need some help from someone who hasn't spoken to him in years, someone who he wasn't always that kind to. Someone, something. Hmm. So this is an eight-issue miniseries, and I think I'm going to pick it up because, you know, I've, I've anytime Dream shows up in the DC universe, I'm loving it. So we'll see where where it goes. I can't tell. I guess it's just a normal comic. It's not it doesn't have any like dark label on it or anything. But if it's John Constantine, you can pretty much be assured it's going to be on the edge. Corey. Well, and I also want to point out a rumor that is floating around, by the way. Oh, what's that? 
there are people at DC now that the person overseeing DC's overseer, <laughs> basically the VP who was like, get rid of, get rid of, get rid of, get rid of. Now that they're gone, people at DC are talking about bringing Vertigo back. That could be fun. Yeah. I mean, there was they did some awesome stuff. There's stuff in from Vertigo I still reread to this day. And also Vertigo was really good at getting media deals that let that do better than regular DC. Mm. Not not CW notwithstanding. They had their run. Yeah, but I'm talking like iZombie, mm-hmm. Sandman, um, Co- the Hellblazer Constantine, Preacher, on and on and oh, on, yeah. on and on and on. But not the boys. That was too hot for Vertigo. <laughs> no. Number one show on Amazon, by the way. For me, from here on out, it's just collected editions. And I will say this. DC has a lot more collected editions. In okay. the past... Let me let me just point out... For the past, like, three, four months, it would be like there's eight trade papers. Oh, that's yeah, it. We're like, yeah, They've not. got pages of them. Oh, yeah. I, the last comic I'll point out is just right there on page 30. Again, it's a reprint. Batman Joker, the Deadly Duo, Unplugged Number 1, which is basically black and white with Mark Silvestri's art on full display. After that, yeah, I've, that's all I've got left other than the normal comics I collect. So what's your first one on your uh, on your list of, oh, I got to have it? Page 42. Oh, I oh. think I'm there with you. The Little Endless Storybook yes. box set by Joe Thompson. This reprints her two Little Endless comics that were on these, they were these little, you know, almost digest sized books. And these are a little bigger, but they're in hardcover. These are wonderful books. These are absolutely wonderful books. Reprinting Jill Thompson doing her version of The Endless, almost as if they were kids. So much fun. Jill Thompson's one of those creators who I wish she was doing more because I would buy it in a heartbeat. I miss her work. There are a lot of people who lately I've been thinking, why isn't Jill Thompson putting out anything? Why isn't Phil Jimenez putting out anything, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Joe? I'm, as long as we're talking Sandman, I'm going to pop back to 31. The Sandman Universe, Nightmare Country, the Glass House. I know I mentioned this as a mini series, but here you go. You got it in hardcover form. Reprinting or collecting, I should say, Sandman Universe, Nightmare Country, the Glass House 1 through 6, and the Sandman Universe special. Oh, I can't think of the name. How do you say the witch's name? Thessaly? Yes, that's Okay. So that again, I you know I'm, I'm a big guy. I, all my Sandman are hardcover collections, and this is one I'm definitely going to pick up. On page 43, Batman and Robin by Peter J. Tomasi and Patrick Gleason, book one. This is from the Batman and Robin series that they did after after the new 52 started. I read these stories on the on the app because after New 52, I think after about a year, I had pretty much tapped out unless I knew the creator. And at this point, I did not know Peter Tomasi or Patrick Gleason. I've gone back and read them. These are great Batman stories and really puts a lot of, really kind of takes what Grant Morrison did with Damian Wayne and builds on it to make him a much more interesting character. Also on that page is a book I already have, which is Absolute Final Crisis. If you are a Grant Morrison fan, you probably already have it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Then on page 45. Dun, dun, dun. An omnibus I am not getting. I I backed out on this one, too. Not because I don't want it. Well, you'll see where it's. it's. I already have the stories I want to read. I'm an omnibus this overload. Is Green Lantern, Green Arrow, Hard Traveling Heroes Omnibus. This reprints the Denny O'Neill, Neil Adams, Green Lantern, Green Arrow series. Plus, 
after Green Lantern, Green Arrow was canceled, it was a backup in Flash. And for the first couple stories, Neil Adams still drew it, but then Mike Grell took over. And I love Mike Grell, but it was real early in his career. And also, you, there was a huge drop in quality because Neil Adams was the one kind of suggesting ideas to Daddy O'Neill for the hard traveling heroes. And then after he left, they kind of just became regular superhero stories. And why am I not buying this? Because I already have the slipcase hardcover. Yeah, that's what I'm opening of up. Green Lantern, Green Arrow. I bought this from Daddy uh, O'Neill and Neil Adams. Yeah, I bought this from Pat Gruber at the last con because he was blowing it out at Falcon. Because I know I had it at one time and I must have brought it to the shop and sold it. But yeah, I'm just looking at it because, yeah, you got everything in there. Green Lantern 76 through. 87. They got 89 in here because it's still oh, Neil right. Adam. That's right. And then The Flash. It's 88. 217. One of those big 100 page reprint books. Yeah. And then there's page two seven or flash two seventeen eighteen nineteen have the three Denny O'Neill Neil Adams so that once you told me that this came off my list to buy something to point out because again if you don't have it this is a fantastic way of reading it yeah and it come and it basically has every Neil Adams Green Lantern story yeah yep. Let's then see. on the next page is the one that I know both Joe and I are getting oh yeah yeah. Justice League International Volume, Justice League International Omnibus Volume 3. Yes. I think the, this is it, isn't it? This covers everything. Let's see here. It's a huge it book. It may well be. It may well be. Yeah, because the last thing they got listed is... I'm sorry, I can't see it. I, I, Tell Justice me League it. of America 60... I'm getting too old for this shit. Yes, it does have it all because it's got formerly okay. known as the Justice League. Yes, that's what I was um, Justice Which is League weird, Retroactive. I bought that out of a dollar bin at one of our, our traipsing around, so now I don't. It'll probably go on eBay. So This is the 80s into the early 90s. Wahaha Justice League, where Keith Giffen and J.M.D. Matias kind of turned the Justice League into a sitcom. And before you start rolling your eyes, they did. It was, it was unique at the time. They got in the best artists. This is where everybody learned who Adam Hughes was. This is where everybody learned who Kevin McGuire was. This is where everybody learned who Bart Sears was, Chris Spouse, Chris Wozniak. Uh, it, it was just a fantastic book. And one of the best things about it was it worked with the inherent silliness of superheroes, but also could turn on a dime and give you a tragic story or give oh, you yeah. a story that you know was just really super tense. It was so well done. And I I remember at the time feeling bad for Dan Jurgens because he had to follow this. And Dan Jurgens did a very serviceable Justice League that just felt like it felt like that the Demetrius Giffen thing had kind of existed in this magical world of wonderfulness. And then when Dan Jurgens took over, I'm not saying it's bad, but it was just a regular superhero book. Yeah. And Justice League International was not a regular superhero book. It was amazing. Um, this being the final volume, I am very happy to have the whole thing in one. I remember I first got online back in 1990 with a Commodore 128 from Joe. This was the pre-internet fans, pre-internet internet fans favorite book by far. We would discuss Justice League more than we would discuss the X-Men because we just loved it so much. And going back and reading it, it still holds up. It does. It yeah. still holds up. I will mention so on the same page, a couple good, good, great runs are being republished. Across from the omnibus is JLA Book One, starting the run that Grant Morrison, Mark Miller, et al. did. Well, our, our, 
Howard Porter, a bunch of other people too. This is the legendary 1990 series. I absolutely love this book because not only is it its own continuity, but it also ties in to other continuity without destroying it. It's almost like Grant went out of his way to say, hey, what's going on with Superman? Oh, well, he happens to be a blue energy being. Oh, okay. That's how Superman shows up. The first stories of the art is kind of that that 90s uh, hyper. Howard Porter had a very unique style back then. Yeah. And there were people who you either loved it or you hated it. Yeah. And when it came out, I loved it. But looking at it now, I'm kind of like, but Grant Morrison's story is so cool. I mean, Superman's basically being held captive. I'm not going to reveal too much if you've never read it, because really, you need to. Grant Morrison. And he realizes what's going on, and he just turns his head, and his heat vision just, just, you can feel the power. You know, it's like these guys are lucky to get Superman subdued. He's busting loose. Directly under it is another run that I, I loved, the Justice League New Book 52, book one. This is where you had Jeff Johns starting out, and Jim Lee did the art. Again, the New 52 hit like a hurricane. It was fun. The Justice League, again, was kind of reformed and redone, and it was a blast. I think I, think I read it up until 50. This covers Justice League. 1 through 17, Aquaman 14 through 16, which was a crossover. And like I said, Jim Lee's art. I, I think I'm going to, Gruber's got the omnibus he was selling, and I think I'm going to tell him I'll buy it from him um, just because I'm an omnibus idiot. But again, these are two runs of JLA I highly recommend. I think the Grant Morrison run I have because I bought it from our, our ex-podcasting buddy, uh, Adam Vermillion. Thank you. I, I was going to say uh, Degzard, but that a different different guy. So, yeah, I recommend, again, I'm getting the Omnibus, and I have the other two in other forms. So that's it for yeah. me, DC. What do, you, what do you got to finish us out? Uh, the other thing I want to point out with those two books is they are both huge trade papers. Oh, papers. yeah. They're Excellent both, way to read it. What? They're both over 500 pages. Yeah. Matter of yeah, fact, JLA one's... book one is 600 pages, and it's collecting all of the stuff that ties directly into it. Including so, JLA Wildcats, the never-before-collected JLA Tomorrow Woman, which I wasn't aware of. And then there's like JLA 80-page Giant, the annual Paradise Lost 1 through 3, and a gallery. woo yeah. So that's it for DC. Yep. All and right. now over to Marvel. Over to Marvel. Let's see. I started so again. Much money. <laughs> so right, much yeah. money. Right on page two, Jonathan Hickman's back. Ultimate Spider-Man number one. A new yeah. Ultimate Spider-Man for a new Ultimate Universe. So Hickman's back. Marco. I, I can't read it. Forget, Crescet, guys. Crescetto. Next time we do the previews podcast, just say, Joe, do you got your cheaters with you? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, after the events of Ultimate Invasion, which I absolutely love, the world needs a hero. Who will rise up to take that responsibility? Prepare to be entangled in a web of mystery excitement as the all-new Ultimate Spider-Man comic redefines the wall crawler for the 21st century. Will it be Peter Parker? Will it be somebody else? It's a 40 well, they've, already, they've already oh, leaked that. So, okay. Joe, are you, still, are you still a little irritated about one more day? Very. How would you like to read a story about a 30-ish Peter Parker married to Mary Jane with two kids? Ooh. That's what Ultimate Spider-Man is going to be. So just like Corey did with Batman, buy 40 of them. <laughs> and you get tons of variant covers. So Marvel is showing some of the variant covers. Kudos, Marvel. You know, unless you're doing like an ultra secret variant, which I, you know, you can keep the surprise. What do you got first for Marvel? I will be buying this as a trade paperback, but I want to point it out. Avengers Twilight by Chip Zdarsky and Daniel Arcuna. In a gleaming new world of prosperity, Captain America is no more, no more, but Steve Rogers exists. 
floating through on an America where freedom is an illusion, where the Avengers are strangers and his friends are long dead. But is the dream? How do you assemble Avengers in a world that doesn't want them? This is set. This is another uh, set in the future. Heroes have been, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Not a what if, but a possible future. Yeah, whatever. What if? I like it. I, I'm on it too. And, and it's Chip Marvel? Zdarsky whose stuff is just so goddamn good. Oh yeah. We get four pages of yes. art. Pre, yeah. Kudos to Marvel. I, I rag on Image because I don't get the previews anymore. But this, you, you show me some art. This is a deciding factor. Now I'm gonna I, I'm gonna mention the next thing, and I want to talk to Corey about it to see what he thinks. Starting on page. 11 and going, I think, through page 19 you, is to, uh, Fall of the House of X, Rise of the Power of X, 10 years later. Um, I don't know what to make of all this. I, I reckon because it's like Fall of House of X, Rise of House of X, Cable, Dead X Men, <laughs> and Resurgence of Magneto. This is, of, you know. this is wrapping up the Krakoa era. But 10 this years is, later? Yeah, I don't know what that means. Yeah, and again, it looks, art looks interesting. I've enjoyed the Fall of X. I'm not buying all the freaking stuff because I'm counting on Marvel doing an omnibus of everything, which to which me they is much do. More, yeah, which to me is much more satisfying to read. So again, I point all this out. I probably won't pick it up, even though it's tons of miniseries and it looks interesting as hell. But I just, I'm, you know, again, all of Marvel's books, these are all $5.99 books and $4.99 for some of the, the later miniseries. The Magneto's $5.99. It's a lot of cash for me to drop on something I'm not even sure I'm going to like. Well, who am I kidding? I've liked what they've done. So I'm pretty sure I would like this. Point it out so you let your retailers know if you're interested, because these are all miniseries. And, and then then the next one, two, three, four, six pages is the gang war crossovers. Yep. Again, waiting for the omnibus. I am not buying a regular comic. Now, I again, Power Pack Into the Storm, which is on page, well, there are uh, no page numbers. Yeah, that's page this would 30. Be page 30. Yeah, yeah. On page 30, buying that as a trade, but on page 31, I'm buying the giant size books, baby. Giant the giant size books of the 70s are ones that I still go back to. They oh. are really fun stories. They tried kind of bringing them back in the 90s, but they kind of treated them as throwaway stories. But I am going to be picking up the giant size. So it starts with giant size Spider-Man, Cody Ziegler, and I, Ivan Coelho with a cover by Brian Hitch. I, it, yeah, it's OK. We've got Miles Morales. I'm sorry. Um, Spider-Man versus Venom. OK. <laughs> I like giant size books. And next month is Giant Size Fantastic Four number one with the first time Fabian Nasasia is writing a mainline Fantastic Four book. So I like Giant Size comics. I just, I've always liked them when I was a kid. If I got the Giant Size, it was, oh, cool. Because it was, you got more of a story and it was pretty rare that they were continued. <laughs> and when you don't know if you're going to get the next comic, continued stories i remember it's okay i've got this much money here are all the marvel books which ones have the end okay i'm buying all the ones with the end all right now i have some money left i'll get the fantastic four even though it's continued i'll get spider-man even though it's continued blah 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 we then have a spider-man 2099 miniseries that will all come out in january all five issues so it's going to be a weekly. Joe, are you still there? Yeah, I'm just waiting. Oh, okay. Because I, I, again, trade or nothing. 
Again, and, five bucks a book. That's 25 bucks. I'm pretty sure the graphic novel, unless they do a hardcover first, will be a little less. I agree. But the cool thing is, like the first issue, Marvel Zombie 2099. Issue two, The Lunar Tomb of Dracula. Issue three, <laughs> Werewolf Unleashed. Number four, Tomorrow's Terror Incorporated. And then yeah. number five, The Rebirth of the Man Thing. Do you think maybe this would have been better in October, guys? Eh, what do I know? I'm going to go back to page 27. Beware of the Planet of the Apes. An all-new series set in the original era. Boom. You got me. I haven't watched the Tim Burton films. I'll probably enjoy them when I get around to it. It's on my to-do list, okay? Tim Burton only did one movie. The ones after that are by different people, and they yeah, are but they're phenomenal. Yeah. Again, they're all part of that universe. For me... No, they're not. They're not. Either way, it's Tim a different... Burton's it's movie. a different... Irrelevant. It's, it's all on its own. A different universe. Don't know, don't care, haven't got to it. But I love the original era. I loved the Star Trek Planet of the Apes crossover because they went through a warp to the original Planet of the Apes. I've got a book which I've raved about years ago that is a, a story that follows, I think his name was Brent. He's the guy we see who has his, his, uh, head carved out when Taylor sees him and says, you lobotomized him. Yeah. It deals with him because somehow, you know, there's a whole story back there where he was talking. Obviously he talked to somebody, probably Dr. Zayas, who decided to carve his head up. And it, it deals with, because of his, he was in, he was in touch with the people in the forbidden zone long before we got to beneath the planet of the apes and it kind of follows his story arc as to what happened to him after he was captured you know because we found out what happened to and i can't remember the name of the, the black astronaut you know they stuffed them anyways in this one cornelius and zira are the only apes alive who see value in the mute dumb human race but even they know human capabilities have severe limits so when their nephew Lucius goes missing. It's with great trepidation that they turn to a human ally, a young woman who will someday earn the monkier Nova. So this must take place before Planet of the Apes. And it, again, part of the whole continuity in my brain in that book I was previous mentioned, Lucius is the one who figures out how to fly Taylor's ship and get it to the surface and he finds the manual and he reads it. So if you're always questioning like, you know, was it Escape from Planet Apes? How did they do it? This book kind of fills in the holes. And again, these are things in these miniseries they could cover. There is, to me, the, the original has so much going for it. And I even, you, you remember the, the uh, animated cartoon, Corey? Yes. It takes place after the original Planet of the Apes movies. So you're thinking, oh, didn't the planet Earth get destroyed? And I'm kind of like, well, not necessarily, because that could take place somewhere else. You know, that planet-busting bomb maybe didn't destroy the whole planet. So, and again, another series I've got on DVD standing right behind me, and I'm dying to read, you know, or watch again. So I love Planet of the Apes. Going back to this is... is something that I just am absolutely excited for. Oh, and I, is that the, I just passed by something on page 28. Is that, have we seen Mary Jane as jackpot before? No. Okay, pick it up. There's your first issue debut. This is a, is it a one shot? It's well, a one the, shot. Her, her debut will be an amazing Spider-Man 31. Okay, so pick up 20 of those. Corey has said so. The magic number is 20. And then pick up 20 of these. I imagine a Marvel exec listening to us going, oh, I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you got next, Corey? I don't have a lot in the way of comics. I do want to point out on page 48, they are reprinting the facsimile edition reprint of X-Men number four. Yeah. <laughs> and then on page 54, 
they are reprinting the reprint of Amazing Spider-Man 252. Mm -hmm. Then on page 55, they are reprinting Marvel Superheroes Secret Wars number one. And I want to check something. I think next month they're reprinting number two. Oh, they may be reprinting the entire um, Secret Wars issue that by issue. Fun. And I'm I've got these. I don't have my 252. I sold it years ago and blah, blah, blah. I think I might go for the foil covers on these. It, the, my only suspicion and. Yeah, we we order through discount comic book service. They're very good at getting the foils to us in decent shape. That's really the only problem. Nothing worse than getting a foil and seeing a ding on it. So, yeah, I, I, I'm all for that. And then they also have hidden gem covers. So if you don't necessarily want to go with the original, how dare you? I'm going right. to back up. Well, oh, did Hold you on. find it? Uh, next month. They're reprinting Amazing Spider-Man 253 in a facsimile edition. And then it's Marvel Se Superhero Secret Wars number two. I wonder if for Secret Wars, they're just going to reprint the entire series. Issue by issue. It, it, they're saying it's 40 years Marvel, so maybe I like that idea. I, I will point out, if you are a long-term collector, reprints of 252 go crazy. Here's your chance. You've been warned. I'm going to go back to page 45. Marvel Meow number one. It makes <laughs> its awesome print debut. I I love this stuff. I, I I think I've... Was this a manga? Wasn't there a manga that came out a while back? That this, is... The cat? this is not the manga, but I think there was a, man a manga that followed the cat as it wandered through the Marvel Universe. Because I remember pointing it out. Yeah. Because this, this was all is, on Marvel Unlimited, right? Yep. So it's Marvel's most fearsome and furious heroes here to save the day and beg for treats in the process. Chewie, Lilo, Alpine, and the rest of the Avenger feline friends, as they call us a few catastrophes. I, I love this stuff. I love the Jeff books. I love Alligator Loki. You know, and it's a one shot. As long as you as long as they come out every so often, oh yeah, I'll pick them up. And I think I, along with you, that's it for comics, other than, you know, the normal stuff we buy that we don't really talk about. So let's get to where all our money goes. <sighs> can, I, can I just, yeah, go ahead. Cause... Page 88 yep. from Omnibus Volume 2. This brings it up to issue 50, so that means there will be three omnibuses altogether. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and, uh, you know, we've already, we're big on ROM, and I went with Volume 2. Of course, because we already pre-ordered one, and I think I think I went with the Zek cover. I did too, because yeah. I love Bill Sienkiewicz, but I do not like that that drawing of. I wrong. think that was on an annual, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, now here's the part where I'm going to sit back, and Corey's going to tell us why he's going to have to buy a new trailer home to fit. All of his omnibuses. Well, um, <sighs> on the next page is Captain America by Nick Spencer, Omnibus Volume 2. There were people who did not like this just because of the shock ending of Issue 1, which to me always has shown that, one, they don't understand how comics work, and two, they did not read the lead up yep. that pretty much set up that Cap had been replaced by someone evil. The story that Nick Spencer told was, what if the one character that everyone trusted was evil? And I don't know if it got truncated or what, but I don't think they really explored it as much as they could have. But this has the second part, which is everything leading up to Secret Empire and then the aftermath of Secret Empire. The next book is one I'm not picking up, but one that I know a lot of people will like. And for me, I think it was more my age that kept me from liking it. And that is Captain America by Mark Grunewald. Butch uh, thinks this is the greatest run of Captain America ever. There were a lot of people who really loved this. And for me, it really... My problem with it was it took superheroes and 
supervillains from being something special to, in a lot of ways, just kind of making them a little more mundane. It's hard for me to put into words, but Captain America and basically it was people living their regular lives, but they'd have fights, but they would do it all in costume. So in some ways, he, Mark Grunewald was trying to capture that Stan Lee soap opera thing, but he didn't seem to grasp that the soap opera aspect was the secret identity part of it. In this, Captain America, it, we did get some Steve Rogers, but not enough that you actually ever cared about Steve Rogers. This was very much, in my mind, kind of average superhero stuff. And when comics were cheap, it was okay. But once comics got to be like a buck fifty, it was this is not interesting enough for me to pay a buck fifty for. But there are people who absolutely love it. Good for them. I'm glad it's there for them. It's not for me because in this story, it made Captain America just kind of seem like generic superhero dude. But I want to point it out because, like I said, Butch and other people I know just rave about how much they love this run. On the next page is a book I will go out of my way to avoid. <laughs> Incredible Hulk by John Byrne and Joe and um, Joe Casey. And the thing is, when you look at it, Joe Casey's name is first because this is another book where John Byrne got irritated and wandered off mid-story. It's the Hulk stories after Peter David left. And the sad thing about it was Peter David had built this really complex psychological explanation for the Hulk. He had built this world that Hulk was involved in that was connected with the Marvel Universe. And then everybody afterward was like, yeah, we're ignoring all that. I found this book to be not just mediocre, but kind of another one of those, yeah, we didn't like what the previous guy did, so we're going to ignore it all and undo it, et cetera, et cetera. On the page after that, another book I'm not getting because I I have all of these comics. And, well, they're okay. They're okay. Spider-Man by Michelini and Bagley, Omnibus Volume 1. David Michelini had been writing Spider-Man since issue 298. He continued to write it. And when Mark Bagley came on, Bagley was very much a loved artist as well. Not as hot as uh, Todd McFarlane. This is a good run if you like Spider-Man. This is a great Spider-Man run. A lot of action, a lot of soap opera. It, to me, it showed that the Spider-Man Mary Jane wedding was something that writers could use, that it made the character work. It's a fun series. I've already got it all. I've read it all. It's not something that I'm going to go back to again and again and again and again, but I really enjoyed it. The next three omnibuses are all reprints, and they're well worth reading if you, well worth getting if, one, you have the money, and two, you don't have them. Fantastic Four by Wade and Waringo, Hulk, World War Hulk Omnibus, and then Punisher Max, the Garth Ennis Omnibus Volume 1. That Punisher by Garth Ennis is the best Punisher stories ever. In a lot of ways, they should have retired the character after Garth Ennis did it. And it's funny how Jason Aaron has now ended the Punisher twice. Because after Garth Ennis's Punisher, he did the Punisher Max series that sort of wrapped up the Punisher. And then last year, he did that Punisher 12 issue series, which wrapped up the Punisher again. But that Punisher by Garth Ennis, the best Punisher stories ever. On the next page is what I'm picking up, and that's just because I've already got the previous two volumes. That is New Warriors Classic Omnibus Volume 3. This is when Fabian Neosasia left left the book, sales started dropping, so to kind of boost sales, they put in the Scarlet Spider. Spoiler alert, it didn't work. It's also got the stories that came after New Warriors ended, such as the Nova wrap-up, the wrap-up in Spectacular Spider-Man, things like that. And then the last omnibus, again, I'm not picking this up, I want to point this out. 
and Joe and I will probably debate this. This is Star Wars Legend, Volume New Republic Omnibus Volume 2. It reprints Star Wars Dark Empire, Dark Empire 2, Empire's End, the comic adaptation of Heir to the Empire, and some other stuff around the same time. Star Wars Heir to the Empire and Star Wars Dark Empire, those are the books that in a lot of ways kick-started the Star Wars revival in the 90s. Star Wars was pretty much a dead property. They hadn't put out books. The comic had been canceled. Nobody cared. Uh, Marvel still had the rights, and they had gotten together with John Wagner and Cam Kennedy to do Dark Empire through Epic. And it was actually announced in the Marvel 1991. Here's what's coming out. Then all of a sudden, the rights were up for grabs. Dark Horse outbid Marvel. They printed Dark. Um, Dark Empire, Heir to the Empire came out and was number one on the New York Times bestseller list for months. And it was, oh crap, people want Star Wars. So they started putting out more Star Wars books, Star Wars comics, etc. This is the best continuation of the original trilogy, period. So good, so well done. If you don't have these stories and you're a Star Wars fan, you need to buy this book. Uh, and Joe, you've said the past it was the toys that brought them back. No, no, I I will say that I agree with you. Now, at the time when I owned Hot Comics, we were very much a Star Wars centric shop because we were really big on Star Wars when we saw this coming out we're like oh this is absolutely brilliant and it sold like crazy i don't know what back issue prices are but they it went nuts and then dark horse had like gold foil logo editions that went crazy gold gold was good when the toys came out people were like oh who's gonna buy these and we're like oh these are brilliant when lucas came and his thing was for a whole generation, you've only seen Star Wars on the small screen. Boom, and he, re- I don't, did he remaster it before he released it? Yes. Anyways, it was out on the big screen. We're all, we were like brilliant. So we were, the hot comics, when I owned it, we were real hip on Star Wars long before the rest of you neophytes joined in. And Corey's <laughs> right, this series is what kicked it off and the toys reignited it just kept things going because that's why you see when you're looking at back issue prices the last couple issues of star wars are crazy priced because nobody wanted them the last power of the force toys the ewok toys the droid toys nobody cared nobody wanted them now oh yeah they're in mint shape, probably upwards of thousand. You know, the power of the forest. Once I had the coins with it, no one collected droids. No one collected the Ewoks. So, yep, I, I can't disagree with you on this one, Corey. We're gonna have to. I know. I know we've disappointed the fans out in Peoria, but don't worry. It's some, something will turn up. Also, the remaster works is continuing with the Avengers. What the remaster works are is they reprint the Marvel Masterworks restored to match the original comics with expanded bonus material. If you already have these, you don't need to get them. But I I like the idea of they're going back and reprinting the original Masterworks with better technology, with more of the stuff they found in the archives, with more historical data. If I didn't already have most of the early Masterworks, I'd probably be getting these. And then the Masterworks are uh, Spider-Man 26, which reprints Spider-Man 271 to 278, as well as the tie-ins. And the Marvel graphic novel, Amazing Spider-Man Hookie. Joe, who drew Hookie? I don't remember. I don't know if I read it. Bertie Wrightson. Oh, Bernie writes in doing a Spider-Man. And then on the other page is Spectacular Spider-Man Volume 7, which reprints Spectacular Spider-Man 80 through 91, which 
has the Fred Hembeck issue. You know what? I do have that hooky. I picked up a book from our buddy down at Cedar Cliff where it's a hardcover book that it reprints all the graphic novels. And I think that okay. one's in it. So I will get to read it. Hooray! We then also have Incredible Hulk Volume 18, which reprints Hulk 266 to 279. There is a part of me that thinks that a lot of these masterworks are being supplanted by the omnibuses. They might just be continuing for... Well, they sell. Like, like, well, yeah, and, and they sell out. I don't think... They probably print as many as they need, and guys like Gruber, who have an extensive masterwork collection, they keep keep them going because they do look fantastic if you have them on the bookshelf. That's why you see them doing two different runs. I also want to point out on page 112, Joe, you talked about Ultimate Invasion, right? Oh, yeah. Mentioned it. Ultimate Invasion Treasury Edition. They reprint the four-issue Ultimate Invasion at treasury size. Mm -hmm. Brian Hitch's work always looks better bigger and i these treasury size reprints are kind of becoming my my achilles heel because i just got the uh x-men demon days by peach momoku oh my god is it beautiful at treasury size and then the of course the black and white and red mini series they're doing at treasury size those those are wonderful as well then let's go to the epics. Oh my God, so many epic collections. I'm amazed they're putting these out. What, they are coming out in February and January. I would have thought these would have sold much better in December, but what do I know? Uh, we get a second Spider-Gwen epic collection, which means the first one sold really well, which is really weird because the regular Spider-Gwen comic has never really been a huge seller. It's the collected editions that sell. And one day, Joe, we're going to have to talk about the uh, chain. Let's, let's uh, pencil in the first podcast of next year talking about the changes in comic publishing and comic retail with all of those articles about how some shops are doing poorly, overall sales are growing, and different shops are doing very, very well. Because for every shop I read about, oh, sales are down and it's depressing, I'm also reading about our shop is adding a second store. Our shop oh, yeah. has just grown, you know, another thousand square feet. So I think we need to do a big market episode. But Spider-Gwen is a great example. As a regular comic, it, it kind of hovers on that cancellation line. But the omnibuses have sold. These epics have sold. The trade paperbacks sell. They're not selling to the Wednesday Warrior. On the next page is another modern era epic collection, and that is The Astonishing X-Men, which reprints the entire Joss Whedon, John Cassidy run. We then get see another modern era epic collection, which is the Brian, Brian Michael Bendis on Daredevil, the start of that run. Then we get Fantastic Four epic collection, Atlantis Rising, volume 24. This is the Nick story. Whenever I think of this run of Fantastic Four by Tom DeFalco and Paul Ryan, I think of the story about Nick where a little kid, he was at a convention and Tom DeFalco was signing stuff and a kid asked, who's that guy? And Nick said loud enough for Tom DeFalco to hear, oh, that's Tom DeFalco, the guy who ruined the Fantastic Four. <laughs> and DeFalco looked around. Tom Brevoort, editor at Marvel, who, will be, who I will be talking about in Freaking and Geeking, talked about how when they were putting this book together, one of the things that really jumped out at him was that Tom DeFalco was obviously being pulled in too many directions to write the book because it did not work issue to issue. Stuff got dropped, stuff got confused, things got changed. And he said, we could either try to go back and fix it or just print it. And because it's an epic collection and the budget on those is, you know, this much, they just had to print it. But he said, as you're reading it, it 
doesn't make any sense <laughs> issue to issue. You could read each issue and go, oh, that was cool. But when you sat down and read issues in a row, you'd go, wait, this, what? Where did that come from? Where did that go? And this is a perfect example of what was going on at Marvel at the time. You had editors writing three and four books and just everything was a mess because it was, well, what looks cool rather than what's a story? Another uh, modern collection, Carnage Epic Collection Volume 3. We get some Star Wars reprints, right? Epic Collection Rise of the Sith Volume 1, and then Empire Volume 1. New printings of Daredevil Epic Collection, Woman Called Widow, which reprints the 64 to 86. Amazing Spider-Man Epic Collection, Secret of the Petrified Tablet. This is the great stuff here. This is Spider-Man 68 to 85, pretty much all jo Stan Lee, John Romita. John Buscema did an issue in there. It also has Amazing Spider-Man Annual 5. Joe, what was Amazing Spider-Man Annual 5? Ah, uh, that was the first appearance of Frogman. No, it was the oh. origin of Peter Parker's parents. Oh, with the red skull. Yep. We then get another Wolverine collection, and all I have to do is look at that cover and go, yeah, that was when I didn't like the book. <laughs> And um, the Mighty Marvel Masterworks, the little ones are up to volume three, which re it reprints Captain America 101 to 105 and the last issues from Tales of Suspense. And that is Marvel. I will point out on page 130, 131, you got a, a line called Marvelverse, where they take a character and they publish all sorts of stuff about it. They've got Wonder Man which I thought was a cool idea. They, they were, it collects Avengers 9, his first appearance. Number 1 from 1986, West Coast Avengers 25 and Avengers 14. And then across from it, one I'm more interested in, Mary Jane, which has reprints Spider-Man Loves Mary Jane 1, Untold Tales of Spider-Man 16, Amazing Spider-Man Annual 19, Amazing Mary Jane 5 and material from many loves of the Amazing Spider-Man number one. But, These are, not, but not Amazing Spider-Man, I think it's what, 39, which was her first appearance with yeah, Face which, It Tiger, you just hit the jackpot. They should have just, hopefully they just reprint that page. That's all you need to do. But these are all, these are young teen books. They're aimed at 10 to 14 year olds. So if you're getting, these aren't coming out until February in March, but these are the type of books you want to give to kids to try to get them interested. And I'll revisit this idea when we get into freaking and geeking. These also are the books that they're making primarily for scholastic book fairs. Yeah. So again, a comic shop should carry them. Most of them probably, well, some of them won't. I was going to say some of the lesser ones, but I know plenty of shops that don't carry them that are pretty sweet. But when I had Hot Comics, oh, yeah, this would be – I had a whole section that was just dedicated to kids. These books would predominantly be in it. And that's it for the uh, supplements. Now grab that previews catalog. Now, one of the things is we are not talking about image as a supplement anymore because oh, – Boring. Image is actually in previews, not with – a whole, you know, not super big, but they do list everything a lot like Dark Horse does. Yeah, which help their sales, kill their sales. I don't know, but it's better than just being all digital. Um, I do miss the art because sometimes that decides for me. So anything before we get to the first premier publisher? No. Okay, because I got a bunch of ads, some interviews. I was just looking to interview this. They got one called Indie Edge, where they're interviewing Jim Ballant. You probably remember him from a Catwoman series and one called the Tarot of the Witchblade. He's also doing some stuff for Opus under the Gene Simmons Dominatrix label. So, Let's remember, he also drew the greatest panel in all of comics history. Oh, yeah. And I think that was issue 86. Your vagina is haunted. 
Ooh. And it, the, I actually read the issue. Other than that frame out of context, it's a terrifying story where the people remember the whole organ donation thing? Yeah. Well, these characters raised from the dead, they decide they want their body parts back. Let's just say the people that are per- currently use them are uh, not necessarily prone to uh, want to give them back or at least be alive when it happens. Uh, all right. The first publisher is Boom. And I have something on page 50. As I try not to get paper cuts, this is just a point out. It's not something I'm buying, but there is another Power Ranger series starting power rangers unlimited the morphin masters number one so if you're a power ranger fan that's definitely something you want to check out on anything from boom for you mr s no all right next up dynamite same thing we already talked about on page 65 is lilo and stitch i again you're talking about all ages stuff I've got, who was I talking? Somebody was, I was talking with just recently realized, you mean there's a Gargoyles series out? Yeah, Dynamite's doing it. Gargoyles, Gargoyles Dark Age might have been a thread I was reading, but I'm like, yeah, these are things that people need to know. You got a Disney fan, Lilo and Stitch fan? This is the book you want. Granted, you might not be able to afford the the uh, retailer incentive foil virgin Joshua Middleton cover for nine ninety nine and and maybe you don't want to give the kid the the David Nakagama metal premium cover that retails for a hundred. However, I w- I would order these. I would have them and make sure I got enough of them and try to keep them on the stands as much as I can. Greg Pack is writing it. There's an interview with him on the following pages. After that. I have aforementioned Gargoyles. Here's a new series, Gargoyles Quest. And this is from the acclaimed author and Gargoyles creator, Greg Weissman. He's joined by artist Pascal Colano. And this is an all new chapter in the ongoing Gargoyles saga. Again, variant covers galore, some really cool other ones. And the last one, again, On page 75, if you're a James Bond fan, another James Bond, 007, number one. M16 is about to be shaken and stirred. And you, you, it's some guy you probably have never heard of, Corey, and you probably wouldn't go out of your way to look for. Uh, Garth Ennis is writing it. I'm going to read you what sold me on this. Okay. Garth, you've chronicled your share of soldiers and spies many a time, but you've never taken on one of the famous fictional secret agents. Is James Bond a figure you've ever thought about writing in the past, and what drew you to him now? Ennis, not until recently. I've been offered Bond before and saw no real appeal. In fact, I found the character ripe for parody, something I indulged fully in my Jimmy's Bastard series. But when I took a look at the Bond of the Fleming novels, as opposed to the larger-than-life figure from the movies, I saw a great deal more potential, a much darker character, and a more interesting world. I have always said that the James Bond in the books is so much more interesting than in the movies. And whenever the movies go back to the books, I like them much better. I like the first three Sean Connery movies because they were direct adaptations. I like On Her Majesty's Secret Service because it was a direct adaptation. I liked um, the Timothy Dalton movie. It wasn't an adaptation, but it was the Bond from the books. Daniel Craig, his movies, especially um, Casino Royale, are from the books. When you use the Bond from the books, he is a cold, heartless murder machine not it's why i whenever i see roger moore bonds they just they're unwatchable now because it's just goofy parody no bond should be uh, bond is a weapon that mi6 aims at people and the reason he is so interesting is 
in the same way that Captain Kirk was interesting in the original Star Trek, he knows a lot of everything and will outthink you. And with Garth Ennis, I am fully prepared for him to have all of the stuff from the books. So I am so excited about this. This was really the only thing from either Boom or Dynamite that I'm picking up. The only other thing I'm going to point out, they have what used to be Dynamite.com exclusive covers. And they're offering them in the previews. On page 95, there's one for Alice Cooper, number one. On page 97, Army of Darkness Forever, number one. And back on page 106, Vampirella Dead Flowers, number one. These are books that were normally only available online. They're basically just running out what they have. And they may be allocated. So if you are so interested, you want to definitely look at them, decide if you'd like them and, and order them. Also on page 97, under Army of Darkness, there are some signed foil editions. Ah, I love me signed books. And that's it for Diamond. And now to Image. Hooray! First one up. Not, By the no, way, I... I want to point something out. Even though Image is not being distributed exclusively through Diamond, Diamond has given them a gem of the month with Cobra Commander number one. Yep. I was going to point that out. If you're a G.I. Joe fan, this is your chance. It's a mini series. The rise of Cobra begins here. We're in a world where Cobra organization hasn't formed one man's sinister plans to utilize the mysterious alien substance known as Energon. Hmm, Whoever heard that before? Send shockwaves across the globe. Who is Cobra Commander? Where does he come from? And why does he sound like Starscream? Hey, um, what horrors is he planning to unleash that will rock the world and maybe the universe to its core? Five issue series. They only show one cover. Boo, boo, image. But you can you choose can, what you want. You could also go to DCB service, download the image preview. Has tons of art and all the covers. Ah, ah forget that. But they do mention they got G covers, so there's obviously more than just the three they're offering. And again, you could show it because down in the corner, there's Ghost Machine one one shot where they show, well, they show three of the dozens of covers. <laughs> Ooh. By the way, Ghost Machine I booed is, Marvel for that crap. I'm booing Image for that crap. Ghost Machine is part of the Jeff Johns superhero universe that he is creating at Image. He is pretty much done at DC, which him leaving DC is kind of amazing because he was their architect for years to the point where he was brought in when the DC movies were starting to stumble. And then after regime change, the people in charge of DC kind of undercut everything he did. Three Jokers had been built up in Batman and Justice League and other places, and then when it came out, it's like, no, it's it's not continuity. Or the what was it? Doomsday Clock was this is you know this is the culmination of DC Rebirth, and then halfway through they were like, yeah, it's not continuity. So a lot of it was him just saying, well, why should I bother putting all this work in on stuff if you're just going to undercut me and kill the sales on stuff? So now he's over at Image, he's doing his own thing. I think a couple other creators have joined him, but this is another one drawn by Gary Frank. On page 112, yes. Deadly Class Compendium. I love these compendiums. They're like omnibuses, but they're trade paperbacks. This reprints the entire Deadly Class series, which is another one of those where it went along and was coming out regularly. Then it got a TV series, so there was a big hiatus, and then the end of it just kind of trickled out on an almost random schedule. This will be much easier to read when it's all collected in one. But then on page 113, I have the original of this, but I am picking up the new version because it has more stuff in it. Oh, yeah. Normal Man 40th Anniversary Omnibus. This reprints Jim Valentino's Normal Man series, which was fantastic. 
it was a 12 issue series about a character who was the only non superpowered person in a superpowered world. And each issue parodied a different comic. But it also held together as a story. Wasn't just all parody. It was also satire, but it also had heart. I loved this book so much. But the original collected edition just had Normal Man 1 through 12 and the Normal Man Annual. This has Normal Man 1 through 12, Normal Man Annual 1, Normal Man Megaton Man Special, Normal Man 20th Anniversary Special, Journey Number 13, where he crossed over with Wolverine McAllister, of all people, Epic Light, and Cerebus 56 and 57, which where there were two backups that tied in with the story. Hardcover, 432 pages, $49.99. This was so good. It's the reason why I followed Jim Valentino wherever he went. And then when he got to Shadowhawk, I was like, no. <laughs> Did not like Shadowhawk at all. Joe, anything on those two pages for you? Above it, Monstrous Volume 2 Deluxe Limited Signed Edition. <sighs> Enough said. Monstrous is, is really, really an awesome series. I've been reading it mostly as the trades come out. And I don't have Volume 1, so if you want to give Joe a Christmas present, the signed version. If you really love him. If you really love him. <sighs> we never get what we want. We still don't have a Wikipedia page. I never get what I want. That's it for me, image-wise. The power to decide who lives and dies. Oh, I thought you wanted real estate. No. Next up are the deluxe publishers. All right. I am going to point something out on page 124. Because Aftershock... Now, one thing Aftershock is saying is, hey, we're going to start printing new comics again. But they have in here Shock Volumes 1 and 2 as a hardcover spotlight. And what it is, this reprints a whole bunch of their one shots in trade paperback form. No, these are hardcovers in hardcover form. I went out onto Amazon because these are stuff that's sitting in their warehouse and was able to get used copies for nine bucks each. So if there's anything in Aftershocks that you see and you go, oh, cool, check if your shop already has it, and then check online because it, these these are just stuff that's hanging out in the warehouse, and there are probably people who read them and are selling them, like Joe. For me, in the deluxe publishers, the only thing I want to point out is under Massa, on page 178, they have a new Zorro comic. So if you're a fan of Zorro, Let's see, Diego is a young man who is convinced that he's Zorro. As a child, he suffered a psychotic break after witnessing the murder of his parents by the drug cartel in his village. To cope with the trauma, he embraced the 200-year-old legend of Zorro by donning the mask, training with the sword, and declaring war on the Narcos, Narcos for the sake of his people. So you've got uh, it's like a modern-day Zorro. Zorro, uh, a lot of different variant covers. Funny, they can show all their variant covers. So we pick and choose. This is, I can't tell if this is, oh, there's a limited sketch cover too. And of course, there are other covers that'll be revealed. You can follow them on social media for updates. I'm trying to see if this is a one shot or a series or a mini series, but it doesn't say, shame on you, massive. And that's it for me, deluxe-wise. Um, go to page 200. Oh, Dark Horse how... considered deluxe? No, because oh. they they distribute outside of Diamond. Okay. So you are, we're in Dark Horse now. Cool. Yep. So BRPD Omnibus Volume 10. I'm buying the Mike Mignola universe in omnibuses. It works better that way. And I never, I understand why they do series and miniseries, but to me, it's just annoying. Under that is Creepy Archives Volume 6. This has the award-winning story Rock God, written by Harlan Ellison, drawn by Neil Adams. Well worth picking up. 
this was when Creepy was still really good. Also, we talked about Empowered a couple of episodes ago. Uh, it's resolicited here. For so, me, everything Dark Horse that I wanted was on the same page. Yeah, for me, there's a couple things I'll point out. Back on page 197, if you're an Avatar fan, there's another comic coming out, Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. Underneath it, Blue Book, 1947, number one. This is a nonfiction comic book experience depicting true stories of UFO abductions with an eye to capturing the strange essence of these encounters. 1947, Kenneth Arnold flew his, let's see, Call Air A2 over the skies of the Pacific Northwest when all of a sudden he saw a blinding flash of silver light. What followed was a bizarre and difficult to explain encounter with several flying objects that would change the course of his life forever. So this is a creator-owned work from the minds of James Tyen the fourth. And one, two, three, four, five covers with one to be revealed. And of course, it's a David Mack cover, so, you know, just ordered for that. On page 198, if you find this, I'm already dead, number one. From the New York Times bestselling creator of Mind Management and co-writer of Berserker with Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves has nothing to do with this series, by the way. This is a multi-dimensional comic odyssey presented in a pulp magazine size format. Robin is a big city reporter embedded with the U.S. Marines and heading to the hostile pocket universe called Terminus. Ten minutes in and the entire Marine squad is wiped out and she has to survive and report on her own. Terminus is full of cosmic wonders and sci-fi gods, gods in quotation marks, that are in the middle of a political power struggle. The language is alien, the politics are deadly. Can she survive long enough to figure out what's going on to get home to tell the story? Again, it magazine format. Uh, underneath it, kill all immortals. Succession meets John Wick with immortal Vikings. A thousand years ago, Viking explorer Eric the Red and his four adult children discover a mysterious source of immortality. Now in our modern world, they're an dynamic billionaire family with the power of a banking empire behind them. But when Eric's only daughter seeks to finally be free from her family's influence, she must be prepared to reveal their supernatural secrets and confront her well-trained siblings in a deadly and epic struggle for power. Funny, they got all their variant covers listed. And that's it for me for Dark Horse. If you go to page 206, About Comics is reprinting the Jam Ehrman Adventures, but above that is Scott Shaw's Comics and Stories about fandom, underground culture, the comics industry, talking animals, gonzo cartoonist, and other stuff. This is a collection of Scott Shaw's stuff that isn't published by other people. Scott Shaw, a lot of mainstream comic people know him from Captain Carrot and the Amazing Zoo Crew, but he did work for animation. He's done work for the Simpsons comic. Every year at San Diego Comic-Con, he has a panel of oddball comics where he finds just the weirdest shit that's ever been published. This is the first collection starring the award-winning cartoonist, most notorious characters with over 200 pages of offbeat stories, other surprises and silliness from the depths of his archives. I love Scott Shaw. Scott Shaw is a big comic fan. Uh, whenever he does a comic, it's really entertaining. I don't know why he doesn't get more work, but I imagine that animation pays a hell of a lot better. It's like uh, there were a couple of comic artists here back in the early 90s who Gary Hartle was one of them who were starting to make their, you know, got their foot in the door at Marvel or DC. And then a local cartoonist was working for Animaniacs and literally went to one of our conventions and went around to anybody who was an artist and said, hey, we're looking for artists. Do you want to work for Warner Brothers? <laughs> and scooped them up. And took him to California. <laughs> also on the next page is a book I want to point out. I don't know if a lot of people will be interested in it, but this one hits me right in the nerddom. 
Black Caesars and Foxy Cleopatras, a history of black exploitation cinema. There, I have such a love for exploitation cinema and low budget weird stuff. And black exploitation was this wonderful little genre of, you know, in the early 70s, they put out tons of movies with black lead characters, almost like superheroes. You had Shaft, Superfly, Dolomite, Foxy Cleopatra, on and on and on. And if you ever want to see a wonderful love letter to them, the movie Black Dynamite, which if you haven't seen it, Get that movie and watch it. It is a wonderful love letter to those black exploitation movies that were, they were like low budget where the lead character was usually into Kung Fu and had to drive all the drug runners out of his, out of his city. The one that's the most serious is Superfly, which I just, I watched it again recently. And despite it being low budget, it's a really really good movie about a guy who's been making his living selling drugs who decides he's done he wants to get out of it but you can't leave crime great soundtrack too great soundtrack joe on page 209 ahoy comics acid chimp versus business one dog <laughs> business, dog, business one dog, shot. dog one shot oh yeah, yeah. The, the ads they're putting up on Facebook for this are amazing. <laughs> yeah, and of course, it's got our buddy Pete Krause doing some of the art. Two covers to choose from. It's Ahoy's Breakout Animal Stars. They're coming muzzle to muzzle with this fifth anniversary one shot. Business Dog is from Billionaire Islands, controls the wealth of nations. Acid Chimp is from My Bad, who's been abducted by crooks and who want to kill him with corrosive acid. Why wouldn't he? Splashing acid is the only thing to do that acid chimp enjoys. <laughs> so it's done by the creative teams of both books. So I think that'll be a lot of fun. On page 228. Joe, do you remember when Archie Love Showdown came out? Oh, yeah. Archie Love Showdown, 30th anniversary edition. This was a story where Archie was going to finally have to choose between Betty and Veronica. It was a four issue story that went through different Archie comics. I don't want to spoil it, but it did introduce a character, reintroduce a character that had not been seen for a long time that, you know, it was kind of, okay, there's your twist ending. But of course it didn't resolve anything because Archie doesn't resolve things. Why would they? That's stupid. This also has the sequel, Love Showdown Special, and all new stories. This was one of the first times that Archie really kind of went after the direct market. Because they, you were getting a lot of stuff around this time. Remember, we're also, this is the 30th anniversary of the death of Superman. It's the 30th anniversary of Batman's back being broken. It's the 30th anniversary of the, these, there were all these big stories. And Archie decided to jump in as well. So that's what this is. It's a trade paperback, 144 pages. Then all they, the only other thing they have are their regular digests. So I really think that the Archie series where, you know, that had been started by Mark Wayne was continuing. I think they've completely forgotten that like they did Archie, oh, yeah. Yeah. Afterlife with Archie. Which is a shame because, again, it never got finished. Archie, you become one of those publishers now where I wait till the story's over. Yep. It's not a place you want to be. Speaking of so, the stories that are over, back on page 216, if you're looking for Valiant Classics, it's under Alien Books. And they got one that I'm picking up, Archer and Armstrong, the classic collection. This is the Barry Windsor Smith, Jim Shooter stuff from when I thought Valiant was fun. I absolutely loved Archer and Armstrong. Archer was the world's greatest hand-to-hand -hand fighter, an expert marksman, and a seeker of truth and righteousness. Armstrong is an immortal warrior who has reluctantly brawled his way from prehistory to modern times, only to realize that the best way to face life's many challenges is to grab a drink. If you've never read these, 
this was a lot of fun. This came out when Jim Shooter had created the Valiant Universe and things were on fire and the early issues were going for serious money because no one was paying attention. And Joe, who drew this? Well, Barry Windsor Smith. There you go. Yeah. And yeah, this collects the the good run from issue zero to twelve. So I highly recommend that. Let's see, I'm gonna try to catch up to Corey because he's way ahead of me. I I'm actually uh, wanted to point out that I just reread these because remember I bought the Valiant Digital. Yeah. They hold up. Oh good. A lot of the other Valiant stuff is not holding up. I'll, there is so much where I'm reading it and it's just dull. Page after page after page of talking heads, which is one of the reasons why Marvel became dull in the mid 80s. But this is very much a opposites have to team up. And it's so much fun and Barry Windsor Smith's art is just kinetic here it's always in motion the pages are always interesting and his coloring is much brighter than other people's he goes for very light colors and I wish more artists would look at that because man the pages are just inviting you look at them and because he's using light blues and light yellows and you know all of these colors his art jumps off the page rather than on a lot of the other stuff, a lot of gray and a lot of brown and a lot of black and a lot of, and, and, and yes, I get that you're going for mood, but it really, it, it makes the books harder to read. Go for bright colors. That's why back in the, in the early days of comics, they always went for bright primary colors because that attracts your attention. Joe. Let's see, I'm on page 219, a graphic novel from Amazing Slave Labor Graphics, A Simple Truth. New from the creator of the acclaimed graphic novel, Josephine, A Simple Truth, Kevin Sacco tells a story about a couple wanting a child and willing to go to any lengths to get one, but their path takes them on a dreadful journey that pulls them away from all that is familiar into the uncharted, uncharted waters of international adoption. So this is based on his own experience. It's a touching and informative, informative story that reflects the work of a graphic novelist at its caring best. If you go to page 280, Fair Square is doing something that irritates me, but I wanna point this book out. So if you haven't already got it, Noir is the New Black. It is 164 page square bound paperback with a whole bunch of crime stories. 17, then there are now 17 stories in this book. They're basically reprinting it and adding more stories, which I hate when they do that. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Because, hey, I supported you the first time and now you're gonna make me buy it again for three new stories. No, no, I'm not gonna do it. Don't do that. Don't. It really leaves a bad taste in people's mouth. However, on the next page is a Howard Jacob book that I think flew under the radar because the way it was printed was weird. It was originally printed in two square bound comics and now it's a trade paperback. It is Sunshine Patriots. Follow the adventures of two members of Roosevelt's Rough Riders Cavalry who arrive in Hollywood in 1913 and find themselves caught in a web of a dangerous new world. The first Sicilian mobsters make their way to the City of Angels. The two heroes find themselves recruited as mercenaries for the movie studios and drawn into the cutthroat world of cinema with a front row seat to the building of a new American empire. Not only did this have some amazing Howard Chaykin art, but this is a period of history that I'm fascinated by. Because when movies started, they would film in New York because Edison owned the copyright on movie making. And he actually would hire goons to, if he found out that you were making a movie, they would show up, break in, destroy your equipment. So movie makers first moved to St. Louis to try and get away. And when 
Edison found out that they were making movies out of St. Louis. He sent his goons there. So they then went all the way out to California to this little suburb in the middle and way outside of LA called Hollywood, which had said, we will not let Edison and his people do that. And Hollywood actually passed laws to prevent it from happening so that that's where the movie business started. And a lot of the people who were involved in the early movie business were uh, of questionable moral per turpitude. So Howard Jacob jumps in and does a story based in that era. It is so fun and just perfectly researched as Howard Jacob would do. And all you have to do is look at the cover and go, yep, that's Howard Jacob art. That's Howard Jacob art. Highly recommended book. Joe? Back on page 227, Notzilla, number one. It's adapted from a hit cult movie, which I wasn't aware of. A strange egg lands in Cleveland and hatches to become the giant monster, Nodzilla. It rampages through the city in search for the one thing it desires. Beer. Three covers to choose from. So check that out and go find the cult movie. Corey? On page 284, another issue of Red Room. This is basically it's set as a trade paperback. Red Room is one of the few horror comics that actually is creepy and scary. Joe, I and think you should you, feel bad reading it. <laughs> yeah, it is extremely dark, extremely dark. Also on the next page is one that I'm wavering on. Fat Cop, <laughs> which reprints a bunch of underground stuff by Johnny Ryan. It's the ping ponging his anti-hero through an ever escalating and cascading series of violent, so scatological, that means poop, and wildly imaginative absurdities. Ryan's brilliance as a visual and verbal gag artist shine on every page, and this masterclass in physical humor and comic storytelling. They're not, you know, one of the things about Fantagraphics is they don't say, oh, this is an okay book. It's No, this comic is fucking brilliant, and you're a moron if you don't buy it. <laughs> Subtle. Back on page 251 under Blood Moon Comics. Eddie, number one. Every aspect of Eddie's life appears to be falling apart, but things seem to turn around when a, the guy of her dreams asks her out. He assaults her, but that's not the worst of it. As she attempts to escape, a voracious alien captures her, consumes her, and changes her forever. I guess that was kind of dark. Five issue series. Corey? I, I have to flip back because let's see here. What is my next book? It's a ways back. All right, I'm, I'm jumping forward. So it's, there'll be, okay. okay. What? Okay, go ahead. On page 358, we have a new printing of the Crimson Saga, which is a war picture library. These are Hugo Pratt, drawn by Hugo Pratt, who was a European artist who did a lot of war comics. A lot of really good stuff. This stuff has not been in print in the U.S. for a long time. I have Night of the Devil and Battle Stations, so I will be getting Crimson Sea. The title story of this collection, The Crimson Sea, tells the tale of a younger brother of an officer, both survivors of the sunken HMS Grapnel, who feels he must step out of his brother's shadow with astonishing acts of bravery. There are three other stories in this collection. Pathfinder focuses on an Australian pilot joining the RAF. Up the Marines features tales of the Royal Marine Commandos being sent on daring missions. And Dark Judgment, two rescued POWs are suspected of not being who they claim to be. These are drawn by Italian comic master Hugo Pratt. I am learning more about European comics. The art style is very different from what we are used to and very different from the Japanese style. And I'm, it's like this whole new world opening up. You know, you start with Asterisk and Tintin, and then you move into these other classic comics. And I'm not saying they're for everyone, but if you're looking for European comics and understanding who the great European comic artists are, Hugo Pratt is one of them. Joe? Let's see, I am on page 328 under Bad Cave. 
Dear editor, I'm sorry, dear editor, that's D E E R editor. A John Doe slaying lures a journalist into a world of political intrigue, a Wi Fi enabled grotto, and a station locker full of secrets. For Bucky, editor of the crime beat, the truth, it's all in a day's work. But Bucky also happens to be a deer. Well, he chased down his last story in the Antler Noir series. And what's fun is you can go to page 329 and see a four page preview of the book. So I got this, this one uh, caught my eye and it actually it's ridiculous enough to work. And if that's not enough, you can go on page 330 and buck around and find out because the interview with the creator, the writer, Ryan K. Lindsay is there. So that's how you get me interested in a new series, folks. Corey? On page 366, there is a company called TKO, which it used to be that you had to order direct from them. And I had really only seen them up at Granite City Comics. Well, now they're in Diamond. So I am looking at the book. TKO presents Tales of Terror, which reprints nine of their uh, one shot books in one trade paperback. And the few TKO books I picked up were very well done. This is an anthology book. So it's, I'm going to pick it up to get a good idea of the other stuff that TKO has been doing. Joe? Let's see, where am I now? I am on page 342 under Oni Press. Jill and the Killers, four issue miniseries. Starts out double size and dangerous with 48 pages. It presents a new kind of game where even murder is much more than it seems. Returning to school, the unsolved disappearance of her mother. After the unsolved disappearance of her mother, teenager Jill Estrada can't wait for things to return to normal. Even as her friends become compulsively obsessed with box killers, a true sign a true crime subscription game where each month's unsolved case is custom tailored to the life of its player. It's only one catch to Jill. The game seems all too real. And when the clues be begin to connect to a series of disappearance in her town, Jill and her friends must uncover the truth behind these mysterious crimes before one of their own becomes the next victim. Murder mystery in a game where stakes couldn't be higher. And all the varying covers shown. Very, thank you, Ani. Corey? The last comic in my list. This is one that I pick up every month, but I want to highlight it, and that is back issue number 150 on page 367. It is a 100-page super spectacular spotlighting the Bronze Age Batman artists. So they have articles on Bob Brown, Dick Giordano, Irv Novak, Frank Robbins, Walt Simonson, Alex Toth, Bernie Wrightson, and they go over Frank Miller's first Batman story. I remember when that was, I worked at Schinder's, that Christmas spectacular, I forget the actual name of it. Anytime one of those showed up, we could not price it high enough. I would look in Overstreet and Overstreet would say, you know, 50 bucks. We'd put it on the wall at 50 bucks. It'd sell in two days. We get another one, put it up at 75. It would sell in two days. No matter how much we raise that price above Overstreet, people would buy it. I doubt they do that now, but it was crazy. Just crazy. So, Joe, I'll let you wrap up your stuff. Well, oddly enough, I've only got one thing left, and it's, it's, oh, wow. it's order again. It's on page 363, and pee pee poo poo. Number 420 and number 69. So here's your chance to uh, catch up on Carolyn Cash's gay modern take of the 1960s. And it, how do you, how do you say it? Ignatz Award winner? Yes. Ignatz. Outstanding mini comic. So check it out. I actually was looking at local comic shops, Facebook pages, and one of them actually has it on their shelf. So I'm going to run out and pick up an issue and maybe actually review it instead of just you know, giggling childishly at the uh, name. 
All right, at this point in time, flip over your catalog because this is what we call For Brian. Brian's one of our listeners who bitterly, bitterly complained, you never cover toys. And you know what? He was right. And of course, Brian absolutely loves pops. Loves him, loves him. <laughs> loves him. He is buried and he's a pop maniac. By so, the way, for, for those of you who have, are newer listeners, Joe is being incredibly sarcastic. What? Never. Me? Never. Because I will recommend on page M33, the Pop Rocks, Lionel Richie vinyl figure. Because I know Brian wants nothing better to look up and see Lionel Richie, the legendary singer-songwriter, staring down at him. Um, so, but because I know he's running out of room, I, I'm not, we'll, we'll get back to the pops in a minute, but, uh, Corey, what else do you think Brian should buy? I'll tell you what I'm buying. Well, that's not as much fun, but yeah, I suppose it's all about um, you. I make it all about you. Go ahead. On page 58, the pop Spider-Man J. Jonah Jameson figure. <laughs> okay. Buy that one too, Brian. <laughs> I love J. Jonah Jameson. I've it always loved J. Jonah Jameson. The, one of my problems I have with Spider-Man comics is he's not in every issue. He should be in every single issue. <laughs> he is the greatest supporting character in comics of all time. And I, I would love to have him there with his copy of the Daily Bugle with Spider-Man Menace. My favorite bugle cover i forget when it was because i've read so many comics but there was one cover spider-man threat or menace <laughs> i love me some j jonah jameson and it'll be nice to have him looking at me as i'm working yes Remind any other toys joe well on page m20 there's a marvel gallery comic silver surfer pvc diorama which looks incredible. So only 80 bucks, so it's not expensive. Like some of the things we know, you know, Brian likes to buy. On page M40, as I got to flip these since I wasn't smart enough to pre-do these, there you've got the First Blood 3 Exquisite Super Series Rambo figure for a mere $90. And this is a previews exclusive, which means it'll probably show up everywhere else, you know, once previews realize they can't sell enough of them and if you go to page m55 these are things that have been ordered before so it's possible brian may have them on his bookshelf already so the two these are all of marvel's different they call them i guess marvel premiere figures and, and I the marvel because, select they have yeah, both marvel select and, and marvel premiere yeah you see them all over the two cool ones to get, of course, will be the Marvel Select Human Torch and the Marvel Select Iceman. It's on page 55 there, so you can have them fighting each other because we all know superheroes are all about misunderstanding and fighting. And that's it for me. I want to direct you back to page 51. This is for Pat. Pat Aga. Godzilla. Godzilla. Zipper mouth figures. Four of them, Atomic Breath Godzilla, Black and White Godzilla, Burning Godzilla, and Standard Godzilla. I am actually really tempted to get that Black and White Godzilla. I'm really tempted because, you know, that I am, Pat may be well known for his love of Godzilla, but I'm the idiot who bought the big Criterion collection of all the Godzilla movies. So it's not like I'm not a Godzilla fan. Now, Joe, this episode is dropping on Black Friday. Ooh, fun. So we're going to be out and about. Yes. That also means that because it is after Thanksgiving and before Christmas, our sponsors are charities that we strongly believe in like this. During the holiday season, we here at Crazy Comics and Stories and the other podcasts in the Solitaire Rose Radio Network turn our ad space over to charities. And the first charity we're going to be highlighting is the Hero Initiative. It's at heroinitiative.org. It helps comic creators in need. The Hero Initiative creates a financial safety net for comic creators who may need emergency medical aid, financial support for the essentials of life, and an avenue back to paying work. Since its inception, the Hero 
Hero Initiative has been fortunate enough to benefit creators with more than $1 million worth of much needed aid fueled by your contributions. It's a chance for all of us to get back to give back something to people who've given us so much enjoyment. You can don't you can donate. You can go to Humble Bundle, and there's usually a bundle there that you can purchase and give part of those proceeds. There's an eBay site where you can purchase uh, art and books that have been donated, and there are other initiatives that you can get out on HeroInitiative.org. That's Hero Initiative. Org, one of the charities we will be highlighting this holiday season. And because it's a previews episode, we've already gone at two hours. Yes. So we just do one freaking and one geeking. Joe, what are you freaking on? Well, mine's kind of a geeking freaking, so I'm just going to do it all, all together at once. The first thing I want to mention, this has nothing to do with anything. A new comic store is opening up December 1st. I mentioned it before. Nerding out Coon Rapids, 3050 Coon Rapids Boulevard in Minneapolis. So, Corey, we're going to have this will be after Black Friday, but I feel a visit. I know every time we visited Nerding Out, we have a great time. So kudos to that. Speaking of visiting, we had a couple things happen in town. We got a Toys R Us that opened up at the Mall of America. So I rushed out to check it out. And I got to say, it's, first of all, you're thinking Toys R Us, Mall of America, it's got to be huge. No, it's probably no bigger than your toy section at Christmas time, Walmart came, Walmart targets. They do have an impressive array of toys, things that I haven't seen elsewhere. Things, there are things that you're thinking, well, why didn't they have more of these? Why did they have more of those? Well, Toys R Us, as it is now, is not a power retailer. Back when it was around, they used to call them category killers. They ordered so many toys and they had so much going on that it just, if you were a toy store, you pretty much were, it was over, game over. You know what I'm saying? It was fun. I ran out and checked it out. It's, like I said, it's small. It's not a, oh my God, I must have. They didn't have any exclusives. They might be too small to have store exclusives like they used to before. You see that little sticker only at Toys R Us. I would hope eventually they do approach someone and say, hey, can you make us some toy exclusives? Because that'll drive the collectors in a frenzy. Uh, the prices are mall prices. They're not cheap. Not like Toys R Us used to be like, well, geez, at my store, I used to sell Marvel Toy Biz figures for 10 bucks because I got them in at like seven, eight bucks. Well, at Toys R Us, they would sell them at six bucks because they were bigger scale. They were able to get things cheaper. So a comic shop needn't fear. They did have the Marvel Select we were talking about. They had some of them there. I actually posted on my Facebook page Pictures of all the different things, the Hot Wheels, whatever. The negatives, I said, nothing's priced. So unless you're going to ask somebody what something is priced, they don't have price scanners. They didn't have individual prices on it. Cool if you're a collector and don't care because you can pick up things and they're absolutely free of any marring or sticker. <laughs> I picked up two things. One of them was a Peanuts figure. Based on the Christmas, these are out of Super 7. So you got Charlie Brown, Linus, and the sad Christmas tree. It's not, it's not sealed, so I can open them up, take them out, display them, and put them back with no problem. The other thing I picked up was a Hot Wheels. The Hot Wheels has the character cars celebrating Disney's 100th, 100 years or 100th anniversary. And they have them of all the different properties. The Marvel ones are Iron Man and Spider-Man. I picked up the Spider-Man just because I like Spider-Man, and I plan to open this sucker. The other thing is, is there are other toy stores. And I'm trying to find it. I, I actually, I didn't go. What I did walk around Mall of America for a little bit, and it was kind of 
a I get, visited the Lego store. They got an Optimus Prime Lego. I saw it first at Target. That once you put it together, it actually transforms. I mean, that's amazing. So a lot of different things. There's another toy store there. I, I think it's. I, I had it written down, but yeah, when you go to Mall of America, you've got Toys R Us. You've got the other toy store. I think it's called. I am not even gonna try, but it's there. I didn't visit it. There's also Nickelodeon toys in the Nickelodeon place. So as a toy collector, you got another place to stop because if you're looking for hot toys, they had a lot of AEW toys there. So just pick them out. I was a little surprised to hear you pick up AEW figures, Corey. Is there, are you just picking up all or just certain ones? I needed Dan Housen. Oh, cool. I did get the bag of swag they were offering. Uh, they gave me in, in these really cool Toys R Us bags, a uh, whole huge item of swag. And I'm, I'm looking at some of it. There's like Jurassic World minis. There's a, a pop figure of Anniversary Freddy, which is a Funko exclusive. Brian, give me a call. Oh, and if you want the Jeffrey figure, which is a Toys R Us exclusive. They got tons of them there for you pop collectors. So I know even as we speak, Brian is probably calling or racing the Toys R Us to pick up his figure. I did donate two of the bigger figures. They had, and I'm, I'm trying to, to find, excuse me, excuse me a moment while I check this out. Because a lot of guys were going to Toys R Us and they were checking it out. And let's see if I can find, of course, looking for anything. Oh, there's the Jeffrey figures. Christopher, yeah, they they picked up, some people picked up some swag and I donated two of them. There was like a Nerf missile thing, you know, for tossing and then a huge box game and I'm trying to figure out what it was named. I mean, this is cool if you had kids and I don't. So what I did is I just, I just turned around. I donated the bag of swag, not the whole bag because I didn't throw it to Lil's. I just gave them to the uh, Toys for Tots people there. So that was kind of fun. You know, again, when I went there, Chris was like, oh, I don't be buying tons of stuff. And I'm like, no promises. I did have a melancholy walk through the mall, especially the Nickelodeon universe, mostly remembering days when my kids were young and they liked to do things like that. But it was fun. One minor freaking. And again, I didn't really look, but I, once, Corey, do you remember what was there that the Mall of America was built on? It was the Met, Met Stadium, right? Yep. Met Stadium was the first major stadium. The Twins, the Vikings played there. They used to have a plaque saying this is where first base was, which was in the corner near the rock and roller coaster. I looked for it. It used to be right in the hallway. It's not there anymore. So apparently Nickelodeon didn't give a damn. Just like Taylor Swift didn't give a damn about us and did not come. Did not come to Minnesota for the Vikings game against Kansas City Chiefs. Thanks, Taylor. Anyway, I shouldn't do that. I don't want Swifties mad at us. Anyways. The other thing I did, I went to a con called MapleCon. Gary, guess how many comic wait, dealers were there? Wait, a con for maple syrup? You would think that. It was and in you Maplewood didn't Mall. tell me? No, because it's in Maplewood Mall. Oh. And that's why it's called MapleCon. How many comic dealers do you think were there? 30. Lower. 20. Okay, start at the beginning and go low. Two. One. Oh my God. Yeah, it's not a comic convention. And I th I was under the, the. Oh, they advertised it, it as if it's one. Yeah, and the, they had the a guy and a, a woman who advertised himself as a real life Peter Griffin. And I saw him walk into the mall and you look at him and go, oh yeah, that's Peter Griffin. <laughs> I didn't see the woman. And they weren't really set up because they had it that you get pictures with both of them. And being that this goes, I went earlier before the podcast to check it out. It may go later, but basically it's just a lot of crafts, arts and crafts and things like that. There is a comic creator there, Nick Padochuk, P-A-L-O-D-I-C-H-U-K. He's there advertising his stuff, local creator, Greenway looks to be, he's got, let's see, Greenway, a couple of his books there. I 
walked by and he was busy, so I didn't stop and talk to him. So you got you got two comic related things there. The guy I did buy from, his name is Matt. He remembers hot comics, so we talked a lot. He's similar boat where my kids don't want my comics. So he was liquidating them. Well, not liquidating them, I should say selling them. And I picked up um, some stuff as you hear him trying to wrestle them out of a box. Um, I picked up a sign book. Corey, you're shocked. I can tell your mouth is cast. I heard your chin hit the floor. A signed Uncanny X-Men 300 signed by John Romita Jr. And it comes with one of those limited treasure edition signature where it's like it's sealed in a bag and it's like the bag is the, the certificate's like half over. And he only did one, let's see, 13,100 of these. So rare, super rare. I picked up a Secret Origin of Superheroes. I'm sorry, DC Superstars present Secret Origin of Superheroes number 17. Corey, do you remember what's significant about that? Which one? DC Superstar presents number 17, an all new collection of Secret Origins of Superheroes. I should, but I don't. It does, it's a it's 60 not. center. Oh, okay. It, it has Green Arrow, the Legion's first case, and it's introducing the Huntress, which is why that book is crazy price if you can find it mint. This one's not, so I bought it like that. Other than that, I, he had a lot of cool stuff, but I, I'm limiting myself because it's Black Friday. I picked up a run of the Adventures of the Super Sons, all 12 issues. I picked up a bunch of $1 books. I'll do it like a giant size Conan 2, just for reading. Uh, some Harley Quinn books, Batman Venture Continues 1. Harley Quinn loves the Joker. Punchline number one. Death of Deadpool one. Immortal She Hulk number one. I think, oh, it's a Marvel Tales. Future Imperfect. Maestro. Just a lot of $1 books. It was fun. I like talking with him. I hope he does well. Again, it's not a Comic Con. While we were talking, one guy come in and go, Is this a Comic Con? No. And he left. You know, didn't even look at the guy's comics, or maybe he looked at him, or he just, you know, whatever. So yeah, little little false advertising, or people just taking the word con and reading into it more than I thought. I mean, I zeroed in on the guy because of he's the only guy there with con boxes, and again, lots of beautiful arts, a lot of crafts. This is the second annual one they've done, so if they ever do another one, it's kind of a nice way to bring a little traffic into the show, into the place, and then they do have the only. FTE store in uh, Minnesota, maybe Wisconsin too. So that's kind of an all, that's a geek shop, all sorts of different geek toys and records and stuff like that, all new stuff. So, and you know, here I just, I just said the, wasn't it the last podcast where I walked through Maplewood Mall and there was nothing there? Cinnabon, I forgot they had a Cinnabon there. So I picked up some of that, came home, choked one down, and now I'm gonna sit back and let Corey talk about his freaking and geeking. Yeah, Cinnabon is one of those things where you really want it until you eat about seven bites of it, and then you're like, yeah. I, I don't ever I, need one of I these. I should again. say I went with the mini bonds for exactly that reason, because a full <laughs> one is like, oh, my God. And I also got to give kudos to the person, because I was like, I just got a nine pack. Well, for two dollars more, you can get five more. I looked at the manager. You got to give her a raise. She's upsizing. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea if he listens to the podcast, but the guy's name is Matt. That I saw, and I hopefully we'll see him at Spring Con and Fall Con because, like you said, he just had one table worth of stuff, and he's like, "I got so much more," and I go, "I hear you." So, what you got for us, Corey? Freaking last week was the busiest week of the year for us. I've talked in the past about open enrollment. It was open enrollment week. I'm gonna vent for a minute. This was the most poorly put together open enrollment I have ever dealt with across all of my employers. All of the information was sent to the people who, you know, all to the employees. We didn't get it until two days before open enrollment. They got it two weeks before open enrollment. People are calling, hey, I just got this mailing. Can you explain blah, blah, blah? No. <laughs> uh, normally, what the managers are told is, 
hey, open enrollment is coming. Make sure to remind your employees to go out to the benefit website to choose their benefits for next year. We got triple the calls that we had projected. Why? Because this year the managers were telling people, call in to do your open enrollment rather than go on the website. We had planned for, you know, 500 calls a day. The last two days of open enrollment, we got around 1600 calls. The last day of open enrollment, I took 101 calls. 101 calls in nine hours. And we had supervisors who were out. So, you know, the, the temps are like asking, hey, I need help with blah, blah, blah. I need help with blah, blah, blah. And they're messaging me saying, Corey, you're an experienced rep. Can you help on this? And I said, I have been on calls, back-to-back -back calls since 8 a.m. I've not had a break between calls because you get 90 seconds and the next if there are calls waiting you get the next call it was back-to-back -back calls the whole day am i going to while helping one person read up on a file for another person to help someone else no i can't do two things at once no one can the whole myth of multitasking is bullshit. it was so poorly planned and the the client did poor, we did poor. We were trained on open enrollment two days before open enrollment began, which meant we had a day to read up on everything, except we were already getting hit with calls and we were still training temps. It was just a mess. It was awful. I'm glad it's over. Normally open enrollment is, yeah, it's really busy, but we made it through. This time it was, this was terrible. And, you know, afterward we always get, here's a survey to tell us how great we did. I am going to be blasting the hell out of them on that survey. And I don't care. Geeking. I think I've mentioned it in the past. Tom Brevoort has been moved, is moving from the Avengers side to the X-Men side. He was asked by the publisher, not the editor in chief, the publisher to move over because he is a group editor. Basically, he's the guy right under the editor in chief and he handled all of the Avengers books. Then Nick Lowe handles all the Spider-Man books and someone else handles all the X-Men books. Well, the X-Men, they're wrapping up the Krakoa storyline. And because the X-Men are now going to start showing up in the Marvel Universe, they're really like, okay, we need to, we need to make the X-Men kind of the focus of the company again. Why is this a geeking? Because Tom Brevoort is throwing out hints and there are stuff that's floating out there that make it seem like he is going to be grabbing some really great talent one of the names that's floating out there as one of the architects for the new X-Men line. Joe, once I say it, you'll, you'll, you'll start giggling of happiness. Gail Simone. Oh, yeah. So I'm look, I've liked the Krakoa era. I wish they were still putting out the paperbacks that reprinted everything in chronological order, but they stopped that because they just weren't selling well enough. I guess I was one of the few people who bought them. Collector item. No, <laughs> for a collector item, there needs to be two things. There needs to be scarcity and there needs to be demand. There's no demand. If you want those paperbacks, I'm not, you, you could get them pretty cheap. I'm not saying now I'm talking about 40, like all those issues of Transformers and the last issue of Star Wars, yeah. But I'm really looking forward to the X-Men revamp. I've liked the Krakoa era, but Tom Brevoort's work on as an editor on the Avengers has always been to get the best people and to try to put together stories that, you know, for each run of the Avengers, you can pick it up. 
one of the problems everybody has with the X-Men is you pick it up and you have to have the history of the X-Men in your head. He's very much of the line of, no, when a new when a new series starts, you should be able to pick up that first issue and go from there without having ever known anything, and we'll fill you in on what you need to know. So I'm really looking forward to it. I, I, as we went through, I like the fact that DC's putting out more trade paperbacks. They're rebuilding their trade section. Marvel is really focusing on making sure that not only are they putting out the stuff that should be in omnibuses and omnibuses, but they're going back to print when people ask. Um, I've talked a lot about near mint collect collections, the series that the Uncanny Omar does on YouTube. Marvel really listens to what the fans have to say about the omnibuses because they know that omnibuses sell to a smaller but very dedicated audience. An omnibus usually sells between 1,000 and 1,500. Well, if you get 300 people who say they're going to buy a book, they could pretty much extrapolate from that that it's going to sell. Wait, are you saying Tom's going to listen to this here podcast? Uh, Tom, would you do me a favor and relax this whole mutants bad, okay? I think with the current storyline, you've pretty much gone as far as it needs to go. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to disappear, but, you know, the Orcus whole storyline is pretty much taken to the extreme. So just as editor, tell people, okay, put it in the background. It doesn't need to be, every time a mutant shows up, someone's got to hate him. Even at the height of Chris Claremont's run, I'm thinking God loves man kill. There were people like, yeah, I don't like mutants, but I'm a cop and I'm here to protect you. So we need some balance here. Thank you, Tom. Looking forward I, to it. I will say this. I won't say how I know this. Ooh, see Corey's secret. The X-Men are going to get far more integrated into the Marvel Universe than they have been in a long, long time. Because yeah. for the longest time, the X-Men have kind of been off on their own little world. They bump up against the Marvel Universe from time to time. But big stuff happens in the X-Men, and it's not reflected in the rest of Marvel. That's done. Believe it or not, kids, you've listened to us blather on about funny books for two and a half hours. Thank you. And we've had two episodes this week. So we have given you all sorts of stuff to listen to as you are driving to and from Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's my favorite holiday because it's not religious, it's not patriotic, it's not this. It's about, and yes, there's the whole, oh, the first Thanksgiving. No, forget all that. Thanksgiving is the time of year when the harvest is done. We celebrate by enjoying the harvest and being thankful for the year that has gone past. Or if you're a Native American, think, yeah, we should have kicked them immigrants off the shore again. Or just burn their blankets. Yeah, yeah. But I, I have developed this wonderful Thanksgiving tradition. And it's because for the longest time, when you work in social services or retail, you don't have days off. I can't tell you how many Christmases and New Year's Days and, Christ and Thanksgivings and every other holiday I've worked because of my work in group homes. But now because they don't offer extra pay on holidays at, at the group home. And if that's, if you work on a Thursday, you're scheduled on Thanksgiving, you gotta find somebody to work it for you, rather than who wants to work Thanksgiving? I have Thanksgiving off. So I wake up early, I go out to Minnesota's largest candy store because it's the last weekend of the year they're open. I try to get there early before the crowds hit and just take my time. And they don't have just candy. They also have pasta and they have pasta sauces and they have local local stuff. Oh, they not they and they have... They've got pies. Corey's going for the pies. The end of season and, pie blowout. He's and and two hall so, is clearing them out. They have every potato chip you've ever heard of in your entire life. Yeah. <laughs> then I come home and I cook. And Mystery Science Theater 3000 usually has a marathon where they have new they stuff do. between. They do. This year, not advertised. This year, it's a two-day marathon. Oh. But you only get to watch one of the days. 
Oh, no. If you subscribe to the Gizmoplex, it's up there that you can watch it later. What a last year, we live in. Last year, they had the 24-hour marathon, and after, like, eight hours, it was like, okay, I need to watch something else. And then I went back and watched it, back and watched the, You know, it, it took about two months to watch the whole thing. <laughs> so then I've got Mystery Science Theater all day. Then on Black Friday, I get together with my best friends and we go to every comic shop we can hit and be utter complete nerds. Is there a better two days in, in the year? No, there's not. Joe? Yes, sir. I want to say, as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you uh, like the most. And I want to say, why should you never use a dull pencil? Because it's pointless. <sighs> I live for that. You know, I, I got I, I to load these up because our Festivus episode, or Corey's, is coming up. Hey, Joe, I went to the store. And as I was checking out, I had the rudest, most obnoxious jerk as a cashier. Aww. I am never using the self-checkout again. <laughs> Hit my music.